This program contains animal treatment that may concern some viewers. Come over to me a bit more, mate. At this point in time, we've just had massive culls in Central Australia, which the amount of loss of revenue simply by shooting these animals and l just lay letting them lie and rot. I, I call it shot to rot. It's just a wave after wave after wave of damage that they do, there's no question. I hate to see them being culled, but I can't see any alternative, really. As Camelliers, uh, we, we couldn't do it ourselves. You, you need people to come and help, and people love to help. And once they get over the uh, intimidation, I suppose you could say, of the size of the camels, and they realise that they're actually gentle giants with, with, with quite nice personalities and characters. Good. Good and they like hanging around people, you know. Camels have a long history through the ages of working with people. They came out as um, cargo rather than as people. So basically it was so many camels, so many donkeys and so many handlers. Camel strings delivered building materials for the string of telegraph stations. The camel teams were carrying uh, the railway sleepers for the laying of the original GAN up to Alice Springs. Miles into Australia. We sort of got a good start here, you know. Yeah, here we go, bang and they're gone. Here we go, it's on. So the Cameliers were left in this terrible dilemma, and the idea of shooting them one by one was just something they couldn't stomach. Basically, they let them go. Desert exploration now in the 21st century has gone full circle. So we're looking at an animal that's now extinct that essentially could have been as big, if not bigger, than a camel. Except it was a wombat. Except it was a wombat. It's the human story of Australia's deserts. And there's the great adventure. Hello, I'm Robin Davidson. In 1977, I set out to cross half of Australia on my own with some camels. You must be mad, girly. You know, that's about 2,000 miles. Six months of hard walk. Huh? It seemed to capture the imagination of a lot of people at the time, and I think it still does. OK, maybe a, uh, uh, a tiny smile? What about honest journalism? I wrote a book called Tracks, and recently, it's been made into a film covering that nine-month journey through the desert to the sea. But I think the real heroes of that journey were my wonderful camels. And as you are about to see, they are truly astonishing, charming animals. I went to work for a camel wrangler named Sally Mohammed. He came from a long line of Afghan cameliers. Robin, arms up, you're gonna look tall. He was a great guy. Very a sort of Australian blokey, country man. But then he put his turban on and put the prayer mat out. So he was this really interesting mix of that part of his inheritance and this very sort of Aussie, integrated, charming man. Our camels are said to be the strongest and healthiest in the world, which is why even back then, Sully was catching them for King Khalid of Saudi Arabia for his racing stables. Oh yes, they're speedy, there's no doubt about that. See, of course, in the early days when the camels come to Australia, they, were, they didn't get them out here for speed. They got them out here to carry heavy loads, and they were, you know, big, strong camels. He helped me a lot. He was catching wild animals. And with Saleh, I got the rough and tumble. So I remember when I chose the camel that I wanted, uh, that he was going to give me um, as payment. She'd just come in from the bush. She'd just been nose-pegged, which is quite a traumatic thing. And she'd had a saddle thrown on her back. And I was put on the saddle and off I went. <laughs> Thank you. 
Robin Davidson and I have been friends for a number of years and, and Robin has been out on a couple of our trips in the Simpson Desert and we share the same love of camels and the same love of the desert and silence and just the no humbug factor of just being out there. When you're with someone out in the desert who has the same values that you have, you don't have to mention it because it's a given, you know. So Robin and I have worked with camels for a couple of years and she recommended me to the director of tracks about supplying the animals for the film, uh, sourcing the camels and working with the actors and actresses. It was a fascinating experience working on a feature film for 13 weeks in South Australia and the Northern Territory. I had to source the 19 camels we needed for the film. Two of the lead camels belonged to me. Well, this guy here, this is TC, which is short for tall camel. <laughs> and this guy over here, this is Morgan. Morgan uh, just come out of filming the tracks film. This is his breakfast. Oranges are, uh, camels love oranges. Mm. <laughs> but TC's missing out over here. Big fella. There we go, he's a bit more delicate, aren't you? And Morgan's very vocal, but he's like a big fluffy bear, really. Yeah. Andrew Harper is a modern day explorer and his achievements have been extraordinary. With his camels, he has walked through all of Australia's major deserts. One of those, the Simpson, he has tackled 12 times and he has crossed the entire breadth of Australia along the Tropic of Capricorn. This group of scientists and volunteers are travelling to remote Cowrie Station in South Australia. Then it's a long and bumpy ride to the end of the road and the camel camp. Andrew Harper and his team are preparing for an expedition into the Simpson Desert near Lake Eyre. Their quest? one of the world's rarest fossils. We're very fortunate, and I'm very fortunate, to be able to come out here and do this and share the experience with people who want to find out what makes the arid zone tick. Trying to capture this exquisite place is Joe Bertini, the expedition artist. I've only been travelling with the camels for nine years, so this is my tenth. So initially it was the desert, and then once I'd found the camels and the people, that was it. That's, yeah, no turning back for me now. Since then, she's gone from being a city slicker to a camelier. Artistic practice is exploration and discovery. So to be able to combine it with other people who are working in their particular professional fields, science and whatever their practice may be, that is immediately inspirational for an artist. But then you're surrounded by this incredible landscape, which is also inspirational. And people, like people are in an arena where they transform. The landscape transforms them. been out nine times but I'm not nearly as experienced as those wonderful cameleers. They're stunning. And out with the camels you have no idea where you're going to go because there are no tracks and you just trust Andrew and the other cameleers to take you to wonderful places. So Kelly, when you lead these two fellas in, if you can take them right to the front of the string. Yep. Yeah, just stand up and just say, uh, you know, back up, back up, back up. Mm -hmm. And he knows the deal. 
as Cameliers, uh, we, we couldn't do it ourselves. You, you need people to come and help, and people love to help. And once they get over the uh, intimidation, I suppose you could say, of the size of the camels, and they're, they're big, you know, powerful animals, and they realise that they're actually gentle giants with, which, with quite nice personalities and characters. Good camel. Good camel. They're trained, domesticated pack animals, and, and they like hanging around people. You know, camels have a long history through the ages of working with people, and it shows on these trips, and um, people take to them quite, quite easily, and, they, and they're usually quite surprised. Stand, camels. Stand. Come on, camels. Stand. We're not just going out there with a mob of camels and a mob of scientists. We're doing something that people in this country have done for tens of thousands of years, and that is, of course, walking country. I like Nick because he's one of the oldest. <laughs> The reason we changed focus from commercial trips to walking with purpose was because it's quite evident that you know if we're going to visit these remote areas and these locations we should take some experts with us who can interpret the landscape and what we're seeing and discovering and looking at and so it, it seemed the obvious thing to do was to really delve back into the history books and uh, reactivate those uh, grand surveying explorations of the you know, 19th and early 20th centuries. By the mid-1850s, it was still unknown what exactly lay in Central Australia and whether it was even possible to cross the continent. These trips heading out north from Adelaide were all being brought to a stop by the harshness of Central Australia. They struggled to move ahead, never knowing whether there would be any water over the horizon. Horses can't go on for more than two days satisfactorily carrying loads without drinking. So it was, it was very clear to a number of people that if only camels could be brought to Australia, um, we would be able to advance this exploration project. Hence, that's how we managed to have the camels imported for the Birkin Wills expedition. Of course, everyone used horses in their everyday life back in the mid-1860s, but you need to work camels slightly differently and you need the expertise to be able to do that. So importing the cameliers was equally as important and, in fact, critical to importing the camels. These were men from villages in what is now Pakistan, near the Afghan border. They weren't necessarily Afghan at all. However, many of them saw themselves as affiliated more to Afghanistan because uh, Afghanistan had encompassed that whole area a uh, hundred years or so earlier. It has to be remembered that the Birkin Wills expedition wasn't just about getting to the Gulf of Carpentaria and returning. It wasn't just a race across the continent. It was also ostensibly a scientific expedition uh, to document the plants, the animals, the birds, everything along the way, as well as documenting the landscape and any potential mineral wealth that might be found. The Birkin Wills expedition is remembered because of its mixed success, because of the success in making the crossing and then the failure in reconnecting with the original supply party. And the tragedy lies in the fact that the party had left that morning and they arrived in the afternoon back at the Coopers Creek camp and, and they were doomed. So it's true to say that without the cameliers and without the camels, the Burke and Wills expedition would not probably not even be remembered. It would, would have been a complete debacle. They never would have reached the northern coast.
back in, in those days, what they did was remarkable. And it was. I mean, that took a lot of guts and determination and courage and bravery to do what they did. The physical exertion to do that is, is something that uh, I admire. That's fantastic, you know, what the whole party did. At the same time that Burke and Wills were heading north, Stuart's expedition, not long afterwards, was also setting up. The remarkable thing about Stuart was his expedition was completely outfitted with horses. He got back, he didn't lose any men, and that expedition alone uh, consequently set up the route for the Overland Telegraph Line and then the following the railway line, and also uh, completely started off mass importation of camels into the country to help build those two projects. strings delivered and delivered on time all this infrastructure posts for the telegraph poles the wire that would carry the messages and equipment and food and supplies provisions but also building materials for the string of telegraph stations For the Muslim cameleers, their animals were more than just a way to earn a living. Considered a blessed animal, they were treated with respect. Each camel had a name and was trained to work in teams of up to 70 in one string. Soon a great network of camel routes was crisscrossing the outback and by 1920, at least 20,000 camels and 2,000 cameleers had arrived in Australia. They came out as um, cargo rather than as people, because when they were uh, when they were brought to this country, they were never manifested as, as passengers because of the, the White Australia policy. So basically, it was so many camels, so many donkeys, and so many handlers. The camel teams were carrying uh, the railway sleepers for the laying of the original GAN up to Alice Springs and of course it's now called the GAN as we know. And the story that I subscribe to is that the first passenger on the GAN, so called, was one of these Afghan men who wanted to just quickly get up to Mari or somewhere like that. And uh, so they called it the Afghan Express. Ironically, because it was never an express, it never went fast, and you could more or less step off it as it was going along and jump back on. I think it was probably a bit of Australian droll humour that led to it being called the Afghan Express, which was then shortened to the GAN. If you take an average speed between Murray and Alice Springs, it works out at 20 kilometres an hour. That must make it one of the slowest trains in the world. Steaming up from Adelaide, 600 miles into Australia, bringing stores and mail for drovers on the Birdsville track and the people back of beyond. Afghan people, the Kamaliyas, they did keep to themselves for various reasons. They had their own way of doing things. And in Mari or Hergut Springs, as it was known, there were one time two mosques. And these people had their own viable communities with the exception of their women. Their women did not come with them. And it would have probably surprised them and disappointed them to find that some of the men stayed for longer and longer and longer and some lived out their lives in, in Australia. And this is where these communities become fascinating because these small communities, largely men, but gradually women start forming durable relationships with these charismatic Afghan men who really were impressive and forming families and the descendants from those families are still in those places today. It was a busy town. Yeah. yeah. And there were houses all the way along, right, right through. Yeah. Right all this was through. railway houses. Right through and right that up there. That was with your time, the transshipping time. Yeah. Mm. We sort of got a good start here, you know. 
Okay, let's go for a little let's walk around the place. Around. We're headed over to the race course soon. Dawn Wilmot and Val Gresham grew up in a corrugated iron house in Marie. Today, this town is a lot quieter after the railway was shifted further west. Back in the Camilleering days, Marie was divided in two. On one side were the Europeans, and on the other was an area where the Aborigines and Afghans made their homes. It was called Gan Town. The camels were just loaded. Every piece of iron for these houses, these old houses, would have come up by camel each. A piece of timber and every nail. Most of them don't leak. Little town of Tin, huddling on the edge of the desert, where the great cattle mobs from the north end their weary thousand-mile trek in the hot iron trucks in the railway yards. This remarkable footage is from John Hyer's documentary, Back of Beyond. Shot in the 1950s, it is now regarded as an Australian classic. The retreat of men and women from the immensity of sand. White men, black men, Afghan. The Afghan people needed to be on the fringe because their camels were right next to them and they needed to be right on the edge of town. And this is why you see, see this in Coolgardy, uh, Burke, Broken Hill, Mari, all of these places have their, their Afghan camp. Nice old solid building, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. They did a good job with it. Nice. Well, they opened it up. You know, there was nothing. It, and, and they only had the stars to guide them. You know, they, they didn't have compass. Yeah. Oh, but they were really good with their camels. They, they cared for their camels. They loved their camels. I don't like them, they're dirty things. Hang on, having a bit of trouble here. Like them or not, on one day of every year, the people of this tiny town play host to the Maori Australian Camel Cup. And it doesn't take long for racegoers to realise that on this bulldust track, anything can and will happen. Yeah, here we go, bang and they're gone. Here we go, it's on. Some of these camels were running wild in the Simpson Desert, only a month before race day. Going all right. Oh, he's going a bit wild there. Asama, brother Gus and Trigger. Is it fun to ride a camel? Yes. Yeah, it's pretty fun, but probably not so much fun the first time you ride them. For the visitors, this is a quirky outback event, but for the locals, it's a celebration of their past. And one of the highlights of the day is a special event for the Afghan descendants. She's got in her blood though. I reckon we've got Arnold, Trevor and Brother Gus. We've got the big fella, Brother Gus, he's coming on the inside. After helping to build the railway, the Mari Cameleers provided the transport services out along the Birdsville and Udnadatta tracks. <laughs> but the demise of the camel business, which extended right across Australia, came with the arrival of the internal combustion engine. Gradually what happened was that the trucks came in. So they had someone like Tom Cruise, who's famous and revered along the Birdsfield track, for example, for his pioneering work as a truck driver. The Birdsville track. Made by the bare black feet of desert tribesmen, camel pads and sweating pack horses, it echoes now to a man and his truck, a carrier called Cruz. He really came in following along the Afghan cameleers who had already been carting goods up and down the Birdsfield track for 20 or 30 years. Supplies and mail for lonely cattle stations. Stations measured by thousands of miles, where the man living a hundred miles away is your neighbour. And your only link with the outside world is Her Majesty's Royal Mail, Tom Cruise. Good day, BJ. Hello, Tom Cruise. Two battlers of the Birdsville Trek. Tom Cruise, who goes out today in a truck, and Bija, 
last of the lords of the desert, who carried out food and water on a string of 50 camels. Old Bijar de Verish, the giant Afghan, who fought the desert by compass and by Koran. I remember speaking to Tom about this, and he, he remembered the time that he, he got the first contract to, to drive the truck up the Birdsville track, and that he knew he was displacing those cameleers, that they would be suffering. O Muhammad, leader of all goodness, take into thy counsels my cousin Abdul, son of Marmon, son of the Haji Yosef, son of Hafiz, who perished alone in this stony desert far from the mountains of his homeland. As soon as business started to diminish, the camels had to be placed somewhere. But as the pressure on these places built up, more and more numbers of camels, so you just had too many. They were then breaking into neighbouring pastoral properties. You had friction with the pastorists and a big problem for the government. So the government introduced a camel tax and basically if, if the um, cameleers paid their tax they were given a disc, the camel wore the disc and the camels were free to graze. But if they didn't pay the tax and the, the um, sergeant of police came out and found a camel without a disc on it, he was uh, authorised to shoot the camel on the spot. So the cameleers were left in this terrible dilemma. They had close friendships with these animals who are highly intelligent uh, creatures and, and the idea of shooting them one by one was just something they couldn't stomach. And they knew full well after having been working and traversing parts of the outback for decades and decades that camels would survive very, very well in arid Australia. And so Basically, they let them go. And succeed they did. By 2008, the feral camel population was estimated to have reached one million. The herds had spread over an area of 3.3 million square kilometres. Experts estimated that their population was likely to double every nine years. The finely balanced ecosystems in arid areas of Australia were suffering under the strain caused by the only wild population on the planet. Desert exploration now in the 21st century has gone full circle. We're essentially doing exactly as they did, starting with the Burke and Wills expedition 154 years ago. We're using camels to explore the blank parts of the map. And even though we now know what is in central Australia, we haven't walked over many parts of that area, certainly with scientists and ecologists. And not only that, we're keeping that cameleering heritage well and truly alive. So what do we have in this box? Well, uh, this is the library. So we travel with um, a range of books and texts uh, about the country that we're going through. Travelling on this expedition is geoscientist Dr Kelly Strespeck, and she's keen to learn all she can. Uh, so that people can refer to these all the time about birds, plants and uh, reptiles and uh, things like that. And the most important thing about the library is you have to have your library card. <laughs> and um, these boxes here, uh, this one's about 35 to 40 years old and it's identical to what the Afghan cameleers carried. So these are actually our, our cool boxes. So in here these are aligned with um, material to keep everything cool. So you just open these up at night yep. when it's cool, cool the box down yep. and then you seal it back up again yep. in the day. And once this is full this box weighs 110, 120 kilos. It's not really heavy but it's heavy enough, yeah. Ooh. It's a pity that that tradition is dying out. I mean there's a few camel wallers around Australia and some of them are very good. But I think that sense of using them in the sand country as a pack animal 
just makes a lot of sense. I'm the first to say that our wild camel population, it'd be great if they weren't here. Using domesticated, disciplined pack animals in a controlled situation is a totally different ball game. And that's acceptable because it's far better to be walking the country assisted by pack camels than driving around in a dozen four-wheel drives and leaving tyre marks that will stay there for decades. You learn everything from being on foot and you learn very, very little being in a car because you're slowed up to the pace of the desert. So what you see, you see detail, and you get an understanding, an almost physical understanding. And I feel somewhat sorry for tourists in the four-wheel drives. You know, they're hurtling along with their radios and their fridges and their stoves. And, and I think, well, why leave home? He's terrific with his animals. In a funny sort of way, it's quite confusing because I go out with Andrew and I go to deal with the camels in my way and, of course, it's absolutely wrong for them. You're walking pretty slowly, three to four kilometres an hour. Uh, you might only do 10 or 12 k's a day, perhaps. You're looking at the land constantly. You start to compare what you saw this afternoon with where you set off with this morning, and it all goes into context, as opposed to driving to A to B, where B doesn't fit in with A because you don't know what the 10 k's in between were like. And when you're starting to look at animal tracks or, or plants, that's really important about the whole picture. One kilometre to go. So the best way to do that is to walk. The best way to walk and work effectively is have an animal to carry your gear and you can stay out here for weeks and weeks and weeks on end, leave a small imprint and do some really effective work. And so how does using camels change the way that you do your work as an ecologist? We're not limited by roads or anything like that, so we're able to get you know, right into the heart of the desert. We're places where are often unsurveyed or unvisited by most people. It's phenomenal. I mean, we're walking along and there's rat warrens all over the place. There's rat skulls, there's rat scat, and that tells a story from several years ago. Uh, we're now more in the bust period mm -hmm. for the desert, but several years ago there was, a, there was a boom. And I mean, this place was just rife with life. What you are seeing is a natural wonder that can happen maybe once in a lifetime. Monsoon rains in Queensland flood great rivers which then flow south for hundreds of kilometres. It can take months but massive outback lakes are filled and the water soaks into the parched desert, triggering a spectacular blooming of life. In 2010, 11 and 12, we had continuous and repetitive floods and rain events, not only on the desert fringe and in the river systems, but also right across the desert. It's fascinating to have been on the ground, literally, whilst this has been happening around us. Probably won't see it again in my lifetime. And if the early explorers had come out here in a year like this, with water lapping at the edge of Lake Eyre and seagulls nesting on the islands, they would have been forgiven for believing that they truly had found Australia's inland sea. Well, in 2010, when we were working in the northern Simpson Desert, we were fortunate to have Paul Lockyer and Gary Ticehurst and John Bean from ABC Television come out on one of our expeditions and film. And this was right at the start of the boom. It was a very good season in 2010. 
essentially modern day explorers themselves because they were heading out into the desert, into the arid interior, in what was a boom year of a wet interior, and showing people back on the urban fringe of this country about, well, what's out here? This is what's out here. It's my stream of inspiration, and it's what I need to do my work. So artistically, it has everything. When you're with the camels, you're connected to the landscape, you're within the landscape, and we don't have to carry. For me, it's an analogy of loading them with all my city problems. And you just become the solitary artist walking in the desert with no thoughts in your head other than being a part of the landscape and connected to the landscape. And the camels carry and take all that for you and you can just be free. It was fascinating to be able to document the Northern Simpson in this lush green oasis, basically. It was extraordinary this uh, amazing landscape that had come alive after apparently being dead for so long, but in fact it's not dead, it's just that natural part of the cycle. It's a very special way to travel, to travel with the string of camels. You move through the landscape in a more human way. You approach places in the way people would have approached them in the past on foot. You notice when you haven't seen birds for a while. You notice when you start to see the first few stone artefacts. You notice when you start to see more stone artefacts and you, you know you're near a stone quarry or something. You notice things because they're under your feet. Here we've got a little anvil. You can see the, the yeah. abraded area there. Yep. And down here you can see we've got quite a scatter of stone artefacts and over here we, we can see a lot of finely fragmented animal bone. These are food remains. All these little white specks. Yes, it looks like grass chaff, but it's bone. And We're trying to document a great human story. It's the human story of Australia's deserts. Five million square kilometres, 50,000 years of, of human history, one of the longest autonomous hunter-gatherer traditions in the world, uh, but not a static tradition. And, and there's the great adventure. To some areas I've been visiting now for 25 years or so, but every time I see them, there's a different cast to the landscape. Sometimes the spinifex is knee high, sometimes it's just bare ground and looking very bleak. It's fantastic to see the pulse of life in the country now, but for an archaeologist, I like to see the bones of the country and they're all hidden now. Our studies have encompassed a time from reasonably severe drought right through to continuous and repetitive floods and then back to dry times. On our first expedition in 2007 where we took scientists and ecologists along parts of the Calicoopa Creek in the Simpson Desert Regional Reserve, we did a, an anthropological study documenting all the artefacts that we found. And Dr Mike Smith from the National Museum of Australia was the head of that study. And we also looked at megafauna remains. And the Calicoopa is a known hotspot for, for megafauna. So these are the super animals that lived up to 50,000 years ago in this part of Australia. We found what we believe to be a diprotodon. The diprotodon was around about the size of a very large hippopotamus. So, you know, we're talking an animal that needed a large bulk of food every day. We certainly made the decision then that we should go back and retrieve part of that skeleton. And we made plans to do that in 2008 and 9. But of course, the drought finished and the Simpson went underwater. So it took nearly eight years to get back there to retrieve the megafauna fossil come out here uh, to find a fossil, uh, diprotodon probably it is, uh, is very exciting. I work at the Australian Museum as a volunteer on Fridays and we've got a model of, uh, of a diprotodon there in a skeleton and now to have actually held diprotodon bones in my hand is just oh so exciting, yes.
These are some of his limb bones. So these might have been an upper or lower leg. Mm -hmm. And there's some more, more examples of them here. Mm -hmm. And if you want to compare them to some other bones that we've got, this is a camel ulna, so a lower arm bone of a camel that we picked up on the way out here. And you can see in comparison that they're not too dissimilar. So we're looking at an animal that's now extinct that essentially could have been as bigger, big, if not bigger than a camel. So two, two and a half tonne. Except it was a wombat. Except it was, <laughs> it was a, a wombat. wombat, yeah. So a marsupial. Mm -hmm. so yeah, this is my first paleontological expedition with camels, and I've got to say it's very different but really exciting. So it's hoped that um, once we get the fossils out, and that's obviously taking some time, we're wrapping them up very carefully, and then they're going to go back on our camels and we're going to walk them out of here. The camels, for me, are a method, are a means of getting into the desert without mechanised methods. By contrast, I have been a land manager for a long time in my life and I'm well aware of the impact that camels have. So we need to balance that cultural heritage, which is really interesting and exciting, with controlling the feral animals because the, their impact on the native species and on the landscape is huge. For decades, the feral camel population had been left to breed and roam free. Then, at the start of this century, a prolonged drought forced the camels to search for water. Great herds invaded cattle stations and Aboriginal communities, fouling the waterholes and destroying infrastructure. What you can see now is what camels are doing, just making rubbish, sitting on it and making poo and it's not really good. No, it's it's just a wave after wave after wave of damage that they do, there's no question. But of course Aboriginal mob have a very particular soft-heartedness for camels and they'll say, you know, oh, we don't like to shoot those poor fellows, you know. So I really don't know. Um, I hate to see them being culled, but I can't see any alternative, really. There's just too many and... what to do? Something was done, the, the camel cull program put together. The culling program did dispatch tens of thousands of camels. there was a lot of debate about what should be done because essentially here's a resource, but it's not as easy as that. There is a serial killer in Australia. That would be the Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd. No, I like him. Okay, well, you know what he's doing? He has launched airstrikes, airstrikes against camels in the outback. That's like a genocide, yeah. except for the camel side. It's camel side. It is camel side. camel side. I think it's a disturbing story. Just go and have a bit of a look, but um, you want to be careful with that white shirt, you're going to get it dirty. <laughs> Tamina Ansari is an Afghan born Australian and now an ABC News journalist. Her parents migrated from Afghanistan in the early 1990s. She'd heard all about the camels and has travelled to Central Australia to see them firsthand. Watch your help, watch your help. Good. My interest in camels developed about eight years ago um, through my cousins who actually first exposed me to, you know, the Afghan cameleers. Uh, they were forming a, a, a uni group um, and they decided to call it the Ghan Society. And then I asked them, how did you come up with the Ghan? And then they told me about the Ghan train service. And that's how it led me on to Afghans and the cameleers and the history of it all. The sad part of my research was to find that the camels that the Afghans loved and cherished so much, they've become a problem and, you know, and that's why we've got this camel feral management project. The station's just over a million acres in size. At the moment we're running between three and 4,000 head. The feral camel problem has been a significant issue for Curtin Springs for a long time. 
for decades there's been a lot of camels around uh, and ash has been uh, managing feral camels for a very long time. 2007-8 there was quite a lot of rain around Alice Springs and no rain out here and we had really big problems with the camels, significant issues where we lost hundreds of kilometres of fences in a very short period of time, a lot of damage to infrastructure. We had mobs of thousands moving through the station. So we lost all of that ability to run our normal beef production. It took us three and a half years to put all those fences back. This is quite a big dam uh, that holds an awful lot of water and we need to be able to protect it from the camels particularly. So how high are these fences? So this fence is, you know, almost a bit, six foot basically, so significantly taller than me. And the big pieces of steel that are obviously this tall and concreted over a metre into the ground. And that gives us that, that really strong stability. So anything that can get through this has to be doing a pretty good job. It's taken us quite a long time financially and emotionally to recover from that. We were monitoring the situation. We had motion cameras out on fences. We were recording where we were seeing camel activity, where we were fixing fences, uh, where we were shooting camels. We provided logistical support for the helicopter crews and the shooters, and they were able to give a very timely, targeted response to a situation that was well out of control. Ultimately, we culled between the project and ourselves on the ground almost two and a half thousand camels in a week. We haven't seen many camels for the last 12 months and we haven't seen any activity, uh, very much activity either. And we're very grateful for that. And that ultimately is a result of the, of the culling. Coming up, Tamina. This is your first time on a camel? Yes, my first time. Well, uh, blow me dear. There you go, you just throw the right leg over. At Kings Creek Station, southwest yeah, of Alice Springs, Ian Conway has been mustering camels from the wild for more than 40 years. Walk on, good girl. Initially it was uh, fun before we actually took over Kings Creek Station. Then when we took over the lease it became a, a source of revenue for us and that's how we actually developed the station initially was through sale of camels. The bubs are watching now, look at the bubs, they're ready to go. They're going to follow, look, the whole, whole family's going. Tamina, you got the whole family with you? We exported a lot of camels overseas initially and then we started to supply it to the meat market throughout Australia and also overseas. Thank you. Wow. What do you think of that? That was just incredible. I can't believe it. I can't believe the cameleers used to take these camels through the desert in this heat. They were just amazing people who all played a role in the development of Alice Springs and further regions out of Alice Springs. Come over to me a bit more, mate. Come over to me a bit more. Come over this way. At this point in time, we've just had massive culls in Central Australia, which, you know, when you see the amount of loss to the uh, and particularly to Indigenous people in this country, the amount of loss of revenue simply by shooting these animals and l just lay letting them lie and rot. I, I call it shot to rot. We don't see the numbers coming through here anymore that used to be there. We've shot the numbers out so much so that it's destroyed what little industry was there in the very beginning, which was the start of a more profitable industry for everybody. It is a sustainable industry. Um, it just needs to have somebody that's got the brain power beyond being a bureaucrat sitting in an office saying, let's do this because this is the easy way out. 
look, not only me, but all the other people that deal with camels get requests every day for camels. At this point in time, we're gathering together a mob of camels to go to a gentleman who's setting up dairies in Victoria, and they'll be milking camels. These have been uh, taken out of the bush to be sort of slightly educated before they go. They're not trained, but um, we have to yard them and uh, run them in fence lines so that when they go from here, they'll go into, a, into the milking farm in Victoria. Mm. Are you struggling to, to meet the demand? At this point in time, yes, particularly the numbers that he's wanting, simply because there's not much left out in the, the areas that we used to muster. They've sh either shot them or scared them or whatever else has happened, but um, they've either moved on or they're all dead. Milk is something that's new to us, and uh, we've found from our contact with people who are now trying to set up dairies in Australia that milk in the Middle East is really, really quite prominent and it's very healthy. How you going, Rhett? Right. Hey, Billy. How's yeah. things going, mate? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah. What's happening? You are getting through a few? Yeah, doing a few. Yeah, the abattoirs in South Australia are screaming for camels at the moment as I speak. They would take 200 a week from me at the moment, which I can't provide. We do have a small number of camels being uh, slaughtered in Alice Springs. Look, camel meat is, it doesn't taste much difference to beef. In fact, if I served you a camel steak and a beef steak, you wouldn't know the difference. If I said, pick, pick the camel, you'd find it very difficult to do so. Perhaps you might do it by texture. And if you get over the fact that it's a camel, it's very, very healthy meat. We eat it all the time here. We eat nothing but camel meat on, on our property here with all our staff. That's, that's our main source of protein on Kings Creek Station. The majority of camels slaughtered in Australia need to be halal registered so that it is acceptable to the Muslim community. Every year in Ramadan there are food stalls uh, outside the mosques in areas like Wakemba in Sydney's west and the Muslim community every year is so surprised when the wider community flocks to these stalls just to get uh, get a hold of these camel burgers. They just love it. They have such an appetite for it. In Lakemba, there was a few guys there putting on a show for Ramadan, and they asked me if I could manufacture and source camel for them. Back from the Middle Eastern tradition, um, the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad, ate camel meat. So they, especially within Ramadan, it's, it's all about the Prophet, uh, Islam, fasting and everything else. So if, it's about, okay, the Prophet ate it, so why won't we eat it? It's roughly now in the east coast of Australia. There's probably about 200 stores that are selling it currently. It's growing slowly. We do probably about two or three tonne a month. There'll be a, a, a greater and bigger market overseas to export camels to around the world, but a lot of exporters currently just can't get enough supply. If we start thinking about of trying to secure the livestock for future, we'll definitely will become a, a household name. And I think it just paints a wider picture of the fact that it's not just, a, you know, a, a, a food for the Muslim community, it also serves, a, you know, a purpose for the wider Australian community as well. I don't think there's a solution to the camel population as far as culling is concerned. The culling program did get rid of part of the problem, but it's never going to get rid of the whole problem. Yeah. As far as the arid zone is concerned, yeah. the number one pest is cats. Feral cats are doing far more damage to the ecosystem than the fragile balance with the mammals, marsupials and reptiles. 
than White wild camels. camels are. Their impact on you know, mammal population and reptile population is you know, negligible compared to that of a, a predator. Yep, I'll subscribe. I think we should be, as a country, putting our effort and our talent into trying to do something about the feral cat situation because it's out of control. You can let him go now. We just cannot afford to keep losing more species. We don't have a good track record in Australia of introducing pests, uh, camels included, but that's happened. You know, we've now got to deal with the consequences. But out here in the desert, this is as pristine as it gets. It's a, it's a beautiful wilderness. The traces that we leave, what the camels eat, it'll grow back. The only traces we leave are of our foot and pad prints and the coals from the fireplace. It's a mad move. Yep. In the There's still a lot of areas in Australia that even though there might be a map that says there's the Simpson Desert or there's the Gibson Desert or the Great Sandy Desert, in fact it usually means that no one's walked there in modern times and so we're talking an endless lifetime of walking. There's a lot to see. Walking with an animal in the desert in Australia is the most complete feeling I've ever had in my life. This expedition has finished, but there is one important thing left to do. On the outskirts of Mari lies a small, sand-swept cemetery, and it is here that the modern-day Cameliers have come to pay their respects to those who came before. So, uh, just prior to the turn of the century, pre-First World War, would have been in the prime of the Camelieran era. So without the contribution of the animal itself and their handlers and owners, Australia would have developed, but at a, at a different pace, at a slower pace, in a, in a much different way. Incredible heritage and culture has come to rest here in this land. I think the contribution of the Afghan Camelieras and the camels is incalculable. Right from the start. I think the country owes a lot of debt to those original Cameliers.